Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at chapter 26, which is a fluid, electrolyte, and acid base balance. And so for the fluids of your body, um, on average, it ends up being about 45 liters of, of water all throughout your body. And we can talk about two major water compartments in your body. We have the intracellular fluid compartment and the extracellular fluid compartment. Uh, the intracellular fluid compartment accounts for two-thirds of your body's water. The extracellular fluid compartment is the other third or so. So remember, intracellular fluid is the fluid that you find within your cells. So we're saying that about 66% of all of your body's water is within the cells of your body. And only a third of that, only a third, uh, about 33% or so, is actually in the extracellular fluid. So most of that's going to be like interstitial fluid followed by plasma. And then other examples of extracellular fluid to you guys would be like uh, the fluid you find in synovial joints, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, you know, that, that kind of fluid. So outside of cells. Uh, when we talk about the composition of fluid in our body, we know that it's, it's really rich in a lot of electrolytes, right? So electrolytes are going to be uh, ions that can dissociate with them water, and they can be things like inorganic salts or acids and bases and proteins. But basically, these can conduct electrical current. That's why they're called electrolytes, because they have a charge to them, and electrons can kind of bounce from one ion to the next. Now, uh, it turns out, you guys, that uh, electrolytes have a greater osmotic force than non-electrolytes. So if we're talking about water balance in the body, we have to talk about electrolyte balance too because if you know, well, what's going on with the electrolytes, then we'll know what's going on with water because remember, water follows solutes. So if you have more or less of a certain electrolyte, it's going to change the osmotic balance of your cells or you know, different fluid compartments. and That's going to change where water is going to move across your body. And I think we kind of talked about this a little bit already, right? So because back in the, in the uh, blood chapter, we talked about how there's this protein in your blood called albumin. And if you lose albumin, let's say, if, you know, maybe for in your urine or if your liver can't make enough albumin, uh, we talked about how that's going to decrease the osmotic pressure of your capillary. So fluid just has a tendency to build up in your tissues instead of getting attracted back into your bloodstream, right? That's kind of what this slide is saying here, you guys, is that um, electrolytes and other um, solutes uh, have an osmotic force on water balance. So what this slide here shows is basically the... Uh, composition of different electrolytes in your body fluids. So in red, we have blood plasma, so basically the fluid of your blood. Uh, in blue, we have interstitial fluid, so tissue fluid. And then in gold here, we have intracellular fluid, so the fluid that's within your cells. And then what we have are the different ions of your body, right? Like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and so on. So let's look at sodium first. Now looking at this graph, what we see then is that sodium's in highest concentration in your plasma and your interstitial fluid. So both of those together are part of your extracellular fluid compartment, right? Because plasma and interstitial fluid are in the extracellular fluid. So we're saying that basically sodium's in higher concentration in the ECF, and it's super low concentration within the intracellular fluid. So you might wonder, well, how do you get this gradient? Like from, you know, it's high outside the cell and low inside the cell. Well, that gradient was established by your sodium-potassium pumps, right? So the sodium-potassium pumps of all the cells of your body use the chemical energy and ATP to literally pump, uh, physically pump sodium out of the cell. That way it actually keeps a low concentration of sodium inside the cell, and it's actually in higher concentration outside the cell. And we talked about how this is actually pretty important, right? Because our nerve cells and our muscle cells use this concentration gradient to make and conduct action potentials, right? And action potentials were necessary for communication around your body. But then, if you guys remember, the sodium-potassium pump, also it also pumps potassium at the same time, right? So then, as it's pumping sodium out, it's also pumping potassium in. So what you guys can see here is that potassium is <clears throat> pretty high in the intracellular fluid, and it's low in the extracellular fluid. Now, this is also important too, you guys, because what we're saying then is that you should normally find pretty low levels of extracellular potassium. Potassium should only be high inside your cells, not in the extracellular fluid, so that <clears throat> if you do see something like uh, you know, higher potassium levels in the blood, what that can suggest are cells that have burst, right? So I'll give you this example. Like let's say, let's say if you suspect um, you know, a patient has cancer or a large wound or something, or maybe some internal trauma, one of the ways you can know that, that, that cells have lysed or burst is if you look at their potassium levels in their bloodstream, if they're higher than normal, that suggests that cell, some cells have lysed or burst. 
because normally potassium is low outside the cell. But if cells are lysing and bursting, they're going to release that potassium that's built up inside their intracellular fluid and then basically spill that out into the extracellular fluid, right? So it can change your electrolyte balance. And that can also lead to some other problems too, right? So uh, what we find too, you guys, is that calcium is actually <clears throat> higher in the extracellular fluid, and it's basically indetectable in the intracellular fluid. And the reason why calcium is so low in the intracellular fluid, in fact, you can't even see this on this graph, is that calcium is actually a very important intracellular signaling molecule, right, or atom, rather. So uh, what we find here, then, is that you have to keep calcium levels very, very low on the inside of your cells. Otherwise, you see, like, kind of odd uh, signaling mechanisms going to happen uh, randomly. So, uh, but if calcium levels uh, increase inside the cell, that, that's an important signaling mechanism for, like, cell division and secretion of, of uh, vesicles and that kind of stuff, okay? So we also have magnesium here, too, guys. Remember, mag magnesium is pretty high in the intracellular fluid. It's low in the extracellular fluid. But the reason why magnesium is higher intracellularly is that magnesium is paired with ATP, right? So I don't know if you guys learned about this back, um, I don't know, like in gen bio or something. But like you don't have just like loose ATP floating around your cells. Uh, ATP is actually stabilized with uh, ionized magnesium. So it's always magnesium ATP. Those, those co-occur, right? Um, and so the function here is that magnesium kind of helps stabilize that ATP. It's also an important cofactor <clears throat> in enzymes within your cell. And so uh, that's why we have magnesium kind of higher intracellularly. But what we find, though, you guys, is that if you don't have enough magnesium, then that can lead to some problems inside your cell, including, you know, uh, inability to store ATP, right, or stabilize it. And also you're going to have enzyme difficulties as well. So what that can lead to then would be things like muscle weakness and fatigue and that kind of stuff, okay? <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. Over here, we have bicarbonate ion. Remember, bicarbonate ion comes from uh, carbonic acid. But we find that this is higher in the extracellular fluid, lower in the intracellular fluid. But this is an important buffer to help stabilize pH. And then chloride has the same gradient as sodium. And that makes sense because sodium and chloride go together, right? So chloride's higher in the extracellular fluid, and it's lower in the intracellular fluid. And then we have uh, you know, sulfate and protein ionines and that kind of stuff. Now, this kind of makes sense, though. You'd find more protein inside your cells and less protein outside your cells. And so uh, that's important to note because if these cells burst and they spill that protein out of the cell, now you're changing the osmotic force, right? So I'll give, I'll give you guys an example. There's, there's a type of edema that can occur in your brain, and it's called cytotoxic edema. And what happens is when these neurons burst and they lyse and they dump that protein out of the inside of their cells, all of a sudden there's more protein in the extracellular fluid but that actually attracts water from your blood vessels in your brain tissue, and your brain starts to swell. So just by having cells kind of, you know, uh, kind of uh, break apart or break open, that actually can pull more water inside your brain. And it's not the same as inflammation. This is swelling that's different from inflammation. This would be swelling that's due to a change in water balance, right? So it's important to note what the, you know, elect electrolyte normal balances are because then it gives us an idea of where water is moving, right? Okay, so uh, for normal blood osmolarity, you guys, we're saying it's between 280 and 300 milliosmoles. Uh, what that refers to is just the concentration of these solutes in solution. Um, so it's like fairly salty. Uh, now, what we find then, you guys, is that to keep within this narrow range of osmolarity, uh, we actually have centers in our, we have osmoreceptors in our hypothalamus, which is kind of cool. So there are neurons with receptors that can actually measure the osmolarity of your blood. So if you have a rise in osmolarity, that means your blood became more salty, right? Now, if your blood became more salty, that suggests two things. It suggests either you're dehydrated or you've ingested more salt, right? And so in either case, you're going to want to ingest or retain more water, right? That way you can prevent your blood from becoming too salty, and you can dilute out that salt and keep within a normal range of this osmolarity. So the way you do this, you guys, is that a rise in osmolarity stimulates thirst. So if you're feeling thirsty, it's because of a, this rise in osmolarity. And so then you drink water, which then, then dilutes that salt. But it also stimulates the release of ADH. If you guys remember, antidiuretic hormone uh, is released by the posterior pituitary gland. It stimulates your kidneys to reabsorb more water. That way you don't lose as much water in your urine, right? But that, that also makes sense because you're trying to prevent a further rise in osmolarity 
And the way you do this is by retaining more water and ingesting more water, right? Well, let's think about this one, you guys. How about a decrease in osmolarity? So a decrease in osmolarity would be like your blood is not salty enough. It's like too dilute, right? You might even say that there's too much water or there's not enough salt, okay? So what this does then is it actually inhibits you from being thirsty. And that would make sense because you wouldn't want to ingest more water and potentially dilute your blood further, right? Um, and it also inhibits the release of ADH. And it makes sense that you don't want to release ADH here because then if you don't allow yourself to retain water, then you will lose more water in your urine, which then makes your blood uh, more salty. Does that make sense? Because you're losing water? Okay, cool. So that's going to decrease your osmolarity. Um, I'm sorry, it's going to increase your osmolarity back to a normal level. So you're just looking at like kind of like a feedback loop here, you guys, which keeps you between 280 and 300 milliosmoles. Okay, so what this slide shows is just kind of like the regulation of osmolarity in your body. So what we find then, you guys, is that if uh, osmolarity increases, you get a decrease in saliva production, which makes your mouth dry, and that tells your brain that you're thirsty, which is interesting. So by having dry mouth, it kind of it kind of tricks your brain into thinking you're thirsty. But it's I mean it's still generally true. Like if your mouth's dry, you probably do need water, right? Um, what we also find too, you guys, is if your osmolarity increases, the osmoreceptors of your hypothalamus basically stimulate thirst. And by being thirsty, you seek out water, you drink water, that's absorbed by your GI tract. And then once it's absorbed in your bloodstream, it decreases the osmolarity of your blood. So now you've reversed the change, which is negative feedback, which makes sense, okay? So uh, we also find too, guys, that if your plasma volume is low and your blood pressure is low, we can get the release of angiotensin II, right? <clears throat> we talked about that pathway already. That was the RAAS, which involved your kidneys. And then we said the angiotensin II also caused you to be thirsty. So remember, if, you're, if your blood pressure is low because you're dehydrated, then uh, you, know, you can get angiotensin II, which then makes you thirsty. You seek out water, you absorb that water, and you increase blood volume and decrease osmolarity. So that's just kind of a really cool mechanism here. So what we're saying to you guys is that there's, uh, you know, at least two different mechanisms to stimulate thirst. One would be low blood pressure and the other is osmolarity, right? So the low blood pressure part of this is going to be sensed by the, the kidneys, specifically the granular cells of your kidneys, which are related to renin, right? And then the other part of this is your brain. So if someone's thirsty, we can't assume that it's only because their blood might be salty. Because what can happen here to you guys is that they might be thirsty because their blood pressure is low. They might have normal osmolarity, but really, really low blood pressure, right? And so um, thirst is a little bit more complex than just like, oh, I have too much salt in my blood, okay? So it also could be low blood pressure. So with electrolyte balance, what we're saying to you guys is that uh, these are basically, you know, uh, you know uh, molecules and atoms that have a charge, like positive or negative charge. And so electrolyte balance usually refers to salt balance because salt is the most important electrolyte of any of these. Although not all electrolytes are salts, salt is the most important though because sodium has the strongest osmotic driving force of any other um, electrolyte. And so these salts enter the body through ingestion. Um, so you're going to get them in your food. Uh, but you're going to lose salt in, through secretions of your body, like saliva, sweat, uh, secretions of your GI tract, right, like pancreatic and, and uh, bile secretions. Um, <clears throat> and so it's going to be also lost in vomit. Now, uh, what we need to do then is actually ensure that we have adequate amounts of intake and loss and want to match those pretty well. Um, typically, the, our, our bodies are really good at holding on to salt, but uh, we live in a kind of a we live in a world where salt is pretty easy to come by. Like you know, it's it's not hard to find salt anymore. Like it's pretty easy to get it. Um, but I think in the past, when salt was hard to find because we didn't have like machinery to help dig it up out of the earth, you know, from two thousand feet below the ground. That's where these salt mines are, which is kind of amazing to think about it. Um, so you know, we haven't really adapted to that environment. So now we live in a different kind of world where. Salt is readily available, and our bodies are really good at retaining salt, right? So if we're good at retaining salt, we also retain water. If you retain water, you have higher blood pressure. Now we have lots of hypertension, which makes sense, and there's lots of disease that's associated with that. Um, now, the most important of all these electrolytes, though, you guys, is sodium. 
And so uh, the reason why it's important is that sodium uh, is in really, really high concentration in the extracellular fluid, and it has the strong, strongest osmotic driving force. Now, the way this works is that sodium, because it has a charge, I'm going to do a little, little Na+, plus, okay? It's got a charge. It attracts water via <clears throat> water's charge. So because remember, water is a polar molecule, and polar molecules have a positive, a partial positive end and a partial negative end. So if you guys remember, with, the, with water, we had O, H, O, right? H, two, O. And so this was a partially positive end of water, and this was a partially negative end of water. <clears throat> well, it turns out that these actually attract with each other, okay? But imagine that water can surround this sodium atom, and it forms such a, something called a hydration sphere, okay? So you get a lot of O, H, O's surrounding the sodium. And this is in three dimensions, right? All around the sodium. And so that's kind of how it attracts the water, is that, you know, it's attracted by charge uh, because of uh, opposite charges here. And so that's also why it's a, such a strong osmotic driving force, is that it really kind of pulls water and it grabs onto it, because it wants to have this hydration sphere, right? So uh, it's the only cation exerting significant osmotic pressure, and it controls extracellular fluid volume. And that makes sense, because if you have more sodium in your blood, you're going to attract more water. And if you attract more water, you're going to have a higher blood volume, which means you have a higher blood pressure, right? What if you have less sodium in your blood? Do you have as much of this cation to attract water into your blood? No. So then you're going to have a, you have a lower osmotic driving force, which means that you're not going to have as much water in the bloodstream. You have more water in the tissues or elsewhere, which means you might have a lower blood volume and a lower blood pressure, okay? So uh, it helps control extracellular fluid volume and water distribution. So changes in sodium concentration lead to changes in blood volume, which changes blood pressure. So that's a pretty important to know. This is why we talk about like being careful about not ingesting too much sodium. Because if you do, then you can change your blood volume, which can you know, lead to things like hypertension. So in terms of regulation of sodium balance in the body, you guys, what we find is that um, regardless of like what your sodium state is or whether or not you're releasing aldosterone, you always reabsorb 65% of the sodium that you filter in your nephrons, right? So you pretty much reabsorb almost all of what's fil filtered right away. Additional 25% is reclaimed in the nephron loops, right? So that only leaves, you know, less than 20% of sodium that gets filtered uh, to basically be kind of modifiable. Modifiable. And what's also interesting too is we actually have no mechanisms to secrete excess sodium. So let's say if you did have excess sodium in your diet, our body has no deliberate mechanism to get rid of that excess sodium. The only way you can get rid of this sodium is to prevent yourself from reabsorbing it. And the way you do that is through atrial natriuretic peptide. That's kind of weird. It seems like a weird roundabout way of doing things, right? It's like the only way to get rid of something is to just prevent yourself from reabsorbing it. So you just kind of slowly lose it in your urine, but that takes time, right? It's not like if you ingested a bunch of salt, you know, in one sitting, your body's like, oh, I got too much salt. I better get rid of it all. There's none, there's none of that mechanism in our body. That doesn't exist. So it's kind of, that's kind of a fascinating thing to me, I think, that, that the mechanism for sodium secretion is non-existent in the human body. I mean, it'd be nice if we had that, because what that would mean then is you wouldn't have to worry so much about, like, ingesting sodium, because if you... If we, if we had that mechanism, <clears throat> you could just secrete that excess sodium into your urine <clears throat> and just make really salty urine. So, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so, what, <clears throat> what we find here, guys, is that uh, water in the filtrate follows sodium. So, if you're reabsorbing more sodium, you're going to reabsorb more water, right? If you don't reabsorb that sodium, then you won't reabsorb as much water because the water is going to follow the sodium. Because remember, it's going to keep this hydration sphere with it, okay? So uh, if, you, if you have more sodium in the urine, you have a higher water loss, which means you're going to decrease your blood volume and increase urine output. So uh, what this slide shows you guys is basically the regulation of sodium balance. Um, and it's mediated through, if you guys remember, the hormone aldosterone. So aldosterone is released by the adrenal cortex, and it's stimulated to be released by angiotensin II. So if you guys remember, <clears throat> angiotensin II was was ultimately formed when your blood pressure is too low, right? Or if your glomerular filtration rate is too slow, okay? What angiotensin II does 
is that it stimulates the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. Aldosterone is a hormone that acts on your kidneys, and it does two major things. Okay? So what aldosterone does is it allows you to reabsorb sodium and secrete potassium. But here's the thing, you guys, is these always co-occur. Okay? So it's not like you can only do one and not the other. Like, like you can't just secrete potass potassium and not reabsorb sodium. Okay? These always co-occur at the same time. That's due, that's due to the type of transporter that aldosterone acts upon. Okay? So that if aldosterone is stimulating the kidneys, you are going to reabsorb sodium and secrete potassium. doesn't matter what's going on. That's always going to happen that way. Okay? So what this means then, though, is that there's two different ways we can uh, lead to, this, to the release of aldosterone. The, the one we talked about already was, uh, was angiotensin 2, right? We said angiotensin 2 can um, cause the release of aldosterone by your adrenal cortex. The other one, you guys, is high extracellular potassium. So if your extracellular potassium levels are high, that can also lead to the release of aldosterone. So let's think about this in just terms of like maybe like a hypothetical patient. Let's say if your patient had <clears throat> hyperkalemia or high blood potassium, they're going to release more aldosterone, right? For, for assuming that their adrenal cortex is working properly. Okay, they're going to release more aldo aldosterone. What's that going to do to the potassium and the sodium of their body? If they're releasing aldosterone, are they going to get rid of the sodium or are they going to retain more sodium? They're going to retain more sodium. Good. Are they going to get rid of that potassium or are they going to retain potassium? They're going to get rid of that potassium. Very good. Okay. So here's the weird thing is if someone has hyperkalemia and their potassium levels are high and they start releasing a bunch of aldosterone to try to get rid of that potassium, well, what are they, re what are they retaining in exchange? Sodium. You got it. So then that hyperkalemia then can progress to hypernatremia, where now they have one problem, but now it's led to another because now they're retaining more sodium as a result. So uh, and it's, that's just due to the nature of aldosterone here. And so that's why I always think it's kind of funny when like, people uh, ingest, like, they'll take like potassium chloride um, instead of sodium chloride. You know, sodium chloride is table salt. And they're like, oh, it's not table salt. This is potassium chloride. It's not table salt, right? And they'll, like, they'll sprinkle that in their food because it makes their food still taste kind of salty. It's like a no salt salt kind of thing. So let's say if you're ingesting all that potassium, what's your body going to do next after it absorbs that potassium and your potassium levels are high? Yeah, good. Kind of like eventually you're going to reabsorb more sodium. And it do you do that because you're going to release aldosterone when your potassium levels get up get high, right? So it's almost like you've defeated the purpose at all. Just by ingesting more potassium, you're still going to retain sodium. So it's like, why would you even bother with that, with that no salt, salt stuff if you're still going to retain sodium as a result, right? So uh, I think that's kind of fascinating. All right, guys. So uh, another part of this too is let's say if you did ret retain a lot of salt, do our bodies have any mechanism to deliberately secrete salt? No. Okay. So what can we do, though? What can we do if we do have excess salt? We can prevent ourselves from reabsorbing it, but we can't deliberately secrete it, unfortunately. Okay? So the way this works, you guys, is that we have a hormone called ANP, or atrial natriuretic peptide. Okay? So ANP is released from the atria of your heart. And so we're saying that this is a hormone that's, that comes from your heart, and it's released when, when your uh, atria are stretched. Right? So when you have a lot of stretch in your atria, over time, your atria can release ANP and BNP, right? So ANP and BNP are these natriuretic peptides. They're hormones from the heart that act on the kidneys. And what they do to your kidneys is they prevent your kidneys from reabsorbing as much sodium, which means you're going to lose more sodium into your urine. Now, if you're losing more sodium into your urine, what, what else are you going to lose with that? What follows sodium? Water. You got it. Very good. So what do you guys think ANP does to blood pressure? Lowers blood pressure. Awesome. And this is actually a really cool hormone. What we're saying here, guys, is the heart can release a hormone to protect itself from hypertension. Because if your blood pressure is high and your atria are overstretched, your heart releases a hormone that tells your kidneys, hey, don't reabsorb as much sodium. You start losing more sodium in your urine, which means you lose water. It decreases your blood pressure, which then protects the heart. It's actually kind of cool. And so now what we're saying is that there's a connection then between your heart and your kidneys. It's a hormonal connection. 
So that's, that's, that's one of the, the reasons why I love this class is like you start learning about all these weird connections that we never really, like, really learned about prior. Like, whoa, I didn't know the heart releases a hormone that tells the kidneys, you know, like, hey, don't reabsorb much, much sodium. Well, it does. It's called A&P. And so we actually use this clinically to like figure out if someone's had hypertension because uh, you only release A&P if it's like chronic hypertension. You know, if you exercise and your blood pressure just kind of spikes temporarily during exercise, that's not going to be enough to like, you know, leave the release of ANP. So if you're wondering, okay, well, as someone suffered from hypertension chronically, we can look at ANP and BNP as markers of that because if their BNP levels are elevated and ANP levels are elevated, um, that's going to tell us that they're, they've had high blood pressure for quite a while, right? Cool. All right, guys. So um, what this slide shows then are the different mechanisms that ANP uh, has throughout the body. So remember, your heart stretches, releases ANP, that tells your adrenal cortex to not release aldosterone, which means you don't reabsorb as much sodium. Okay. It also tells your hypothalamus to not release ADH, which means you don't reabsorb as much water, which means you lose more water, which de decreases your blood volume and decreases your blood pressure. Um, a and P also uh, inhibits the release of renin by your kidneys, so you don't release as much angiocentin 2, which means you don't vasoconstrict, so you actually vasodilate as a result, which then decreases your blood pressure as well. Um, and then A and P can also just directly inhibit uh, your kidneys from reabsorbing sodium. So there's kind of four major effects of A and P here, uh, but the whole point of this is a negative feedback because remember, <clears throat> what stimulates the release of A and P initially is high blood pressure. But the effect is low blood pressure. So once your blood pressure is low enough, then you stop releasing as much ANP once you go back to normal. Cool. All right, guys. So, oh, by the way, would you, could you or would you ever want to give someone a drug that acts like ANP? And if so, when would you want to do that? Like, let's say if there was a drug that acts like ANP. Like, who would you want to give that drug to? Someone with hypertension. You got it. And that makes sense, right? Because if they have, if they have hypertension and you give them an A and P-like drug, that's going to ultimately decrease their blood pressure. Okay? Very good. But let's think about this too, guys. Let's, let's say if you did give someone that drug that acts like A and P, what's going to happen to the potassium levels of their body? Let's think about this. A and P inhibits the adrenal cortex from releasing aldosterone. So if you prevent aldosterone from being released, you're preventing the thing that aldosterone uses to regulate potassium levels. So what do you guys think might happen to potassium if you prevent the release of aldosterone? You retain more, you retain more potassium. So that if you give someone a drug that acts like A&P, they might end up getting hyperkalemia as a result because you're preventing their body from secreting aldosterone to get rid of that excess potassium. So this is kind of the problem that, are, that we kind of face. Is like, you can give people drugs, but usually there's like, it's like a double-edged sword. It's like, yeah, I can, I, can, I can help you with your, you know, your blood pressure. Let's help you with that. But you kind of cut yourself in the process. Like, ah, oh, crap, now we got hyperkalemia. You know what I mean? It's like, there's always like this double-edged sword. It's like, yeah, we could, I could decrease your blood pressure, but there's gonna be another problem with that. So I think the kind of the key part here, guys, is just don't get sick in the first place. <laughs> just take care of yourself. <laughs> Um, so, uh, with other hormones, you guys, that affects like sodium balance in your body, uh, you know, estrogens play a role, which is interesting. So, uh, estrogens are involved with sodium chloride reabsorption. So, we're saying that you guys is that when your estrogen levels are high, you're going to reabsorb more sodium, which means you're going to reabsorb more water and retain more water, which means your blood pressure is going to be higher. So, what you find then is that um, pregnant women who have higher estrogen levels uh, are also going to retain more so sodium and water which is also kind of why there's that like perception of being bloated as well, because you just have like more water retention as a consequence of this hormone, right? Um, progesterone decreases sodium reabsorption. And so where you find this in higher kind of concentrations, you guys, is uh, after ovulation, uh, at, you know, at day 14 in the, in the ovarian cycle, so two weeks after the beginning of menses, uh, progesterone levels start to rise, they skyrocket. But what that means though is that you start you start um, not reabsorbing as much sodium, so then you don't retain as much water, so then your blood pressure could presumably be lower and you have more water loss at that period of time. Okay. Now, glucocorticoids are the stress hormones we talked about, like cortisol, but these also increase sodium reabsorption by your kidneys. 
So what do you guys think that means in terms of stress and blood pressure? If stress hormones make you retain more salt, you got it, increases blood pressure. So now you guys are seeing the physiological mechanism here between stress and hypertension is that if you're stressed and you're releasing glucocorticoids, you're retaining more sodium, which means you retain more water and your blood pressure is higher because you have a higher blood volume. That's kind of interesting too. So what would make this even worse is if you're stressed and you also have a high salt diet. So if it's kind of like double whammy, you're already stressed, you have a high salt diet, you're retaining more sodium on top of that, you're going to have a lot of extra water in your body. So, all right, cool. So what about potassium? So potassium is kind of the other side of the story here because we said that potassium you find inside of your cells, not, not in the extracellular fluid, but the intracellular fluid. And uh, it has a really, really strong effect on resting membrane potential. So if you guys remember uh, in our neurons, we talked about how, uh, you know, like let's say if, if I drew like the uh, membrane of a neuron, we said that there was leakage channels, right? So we had sodium, potassium, and chloride leakage channels. So I'm going to draw those really quick. So these leakage channels were always open, right? And so what we found is that potassium leakage channels can leak out potassium. Sodium leakage channels can allow sodium to flow in. And chloride leakage channels can allow chloride to flow in, right? So you have positive charges leaving, positive charges entering, and negative charges entering as well, right? Now, the leakiest of all of these at rest in your neurons was potassium. So because remember, potassium was 25 times more leaky than any other ion um, at rest. So let's think about this, you guys. If potassium is the one that's leaking at rest the most, what's that gonna do to the voltage inside the cell if, you, if, you're, if you're removing a lot of positive charge? It's gonna make it more negative, good. Okay, and that's actually what, that's actually what keeps the inside of your cell negative at rest is potassium. So we're saying that as you guys, is potassium has the biggest influence on the resting voltage of your neurons and your muscle cells. But this is also important to discuss with respect to like potassium imbalance because if you start to have abnormal potassium balances, then you're going to affect the resting membrane voltage, which means you're going to change how easy it is for your neurons and muscle cells to make action potentials. Okay. So let's say if your extracellular fluid potassium levels are higher, that actually decreases your resting membrane potential, which means that your voltage is slightly more positive. So you depolarize more easily, which means your neurons are actually hyper excitable. So higher extracellular potassium makes it easier for your nervous system and your muscles to produce action potentials. What do you guys think this looks like, like in a patient? Like let's say if your, if your patient did have hyperkalemia or high extracellular potassium and it makes their neurons and muscles more excitable. What might that present as? Say it again? Yeah, muscle twitches, very good. So like just like twitching of muscles and stuff, right? Awesome. Uh, how about like, like uh, their, their cognitive functions or just sort of the state of their mind? Confusion, anxiety, rest, restlessness, right? And the reason, the reason being, guys, and maybe even seizures, right? And the reason being is there's just too much activity. Right? It's just hyperactive at this point. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Now, <clears throat> opposite to this, you guys, is that if you have hypokalemia, that actually hyperpolarizes the resting voltage of your cells, which makes you non-responsive. And so that uh, if you have low extracellular potassium, it makes it more difficult for your muscles and nerves to generate action potentials. So what that's going to look like would be like respiratory depression, muscle weakness, right? Um, also confusion. But the other side of this, you guys, wouldn't, wouldn't be anxiety. It'd be more like confusion, somnolence, or sleepiness, fatigue, you know, a decrease in kind of cognitive state, and just uh, maybe even uh, unconsciousness as well. Because if your brain can't make action potentials, you can't sustain uh, consciousness or sort of state of awareness. Awesome. So uh, potassium is also part of your body's buffer system. So we find, you guys, is that you, can, you, you actually can exchange potassium for a hydrogen ion. Uh, to help maintain blood pH. So what happens, you guys, is that hydrogen shifts in and out of cells in the opposite direction of potassium to maintain cation balance. So what we find, you guys, is that if you have acidosis of your blood, your potassium levels rise. Because what happens is if your blood's acidic, your kidneys attempt to get rid of that acid, but they exchange it for the potassium. 
So if your kidneys are attempting to secrete excess acid into your tubular fluid, you're exchanging that for potassium. So potassium levels rise as your blood becomes more acidic. Okay? And the opposite of this, you guys, is that your potassium levels fall as your blood becomes more basic because you're, again, exchanging the two. So let's think about this, you guys. If your blood is becoming more acidic and your potassium levels are rising and you're getting hyperkalemia, what's that going to do to your nervous system and your muscular system? Like, is it, going to, is it going to make it easier for you to make extra potentials or more difficult with hyperkalemia? You guys remember? Easier. You got it. Very good. So what can come with acidosis, if your potassium levels increase, is, you know, muscle cramping, uh, restlessness, anxiety, you know, that kind of stuff, um, muscle twitches. So maybe even like irregular heartbeat, irregular heart rhythm as well. So it's interesting. All right. Cool, guys. So uh, potassium is actually uh, it's actually controlled by aldosterone, and um, it's it's secreted into filtrates. Now uh, this uh, high potassium content favors these cells for secretion, and so like if if you just normally have high potassium, these basically just have secretion naturally in the kidneys without any hormones, and your kidneys have a pretty low ability to retain potassium. So this is the usually the problem you find you guys is actually hypokalemia. And this is probably what you've heard of before because people say, like, okay, like, you know, they're suffering from hypokalemia. Like, they need to have, like, potassium pills with them or, like, go eat a banana or something, right? Um, because uh, our bodies have a pretty poor ability to retain potassium. Um, you know, remember, uh, what does aldosterone do? Does it, is, that invo is aldosterone involved with potassium reabsorption or secretion? Secretion, you got it. In fact, we don't have a hormone for potassium reabsorption. It doesn't exist. So that's, that's actually kind of interesting, too. We don't have a hormone for sodium secretion, and we don't have a hormone for potassium reabsorption. So it's kind of funky. And that would make sense, too, like in terms of how you can get hypokalemia. So um, what you do then is that, uh, let's say if you did a hypokalemia, you can't deliberately reabsorb extra potassium. You can just prevent yourself from secreting additional potassium, which is interesting. So the most important factor affecting potassium secretion, you guys, is the concentration of the ECF. So um, what you find is if you have a high potassium diet and your ECF concentration is high, like if you have high potassium in the extracellular fluid, then uh, potassium gets secreted just naturally. And if you have low potassium diet or in accelerated potassium loss, just prevents or reduces the secretion of potassium, right? You can't deliberately reabsorb it. You can just kind of, kind of slow it down in terms of how fast it's actually secreted out of your body. So then you might wonder, okay, well, where do you get potassium in your diet, right? Well, it's going to be really high in things like meat. Uh, it'll be high in uh, like leafy greens, if that makes sense. You know, certain fruits like bananas, you guys have heard before. Uh, avocados are really high in potassium as well. Um, so usually you don't have to worry about it. If you have a balanced diet, you're probably fine. But if you're just living off of like cereal, like my uncle does, you know, uh, <laughs> that's, all I eat. that's all I eat, I swear to you guys. Because like, I think he's trying to save money. And so he, all he eats is cereal, like for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm like, that can't be healthy, man. That's like, that's like so much sugar. And it's not even like a balanced diet. It's like you're just getting a bunch of lactose and a bunch of just like wheat, wheat you know, and sugar in that. I'm like, Phew. well, whatever, man. You can save some money, I guess. Um, so, but I guess, I guess the thing there too is like, like good food is also expensive. Like you've got to get like fresh food. It's, it's actually pretty, pretty expensive. But, you know, like, what I've been doing for myself, you guys, I've been, a lot, I've been buying, like, a lot of, like, frozen vegetables and stuff. And that's still, like, pretty good. It's not fresh, but it's, it's actually probably even more nutritious than the fresh food in the counter because they freeze it on site. Like, you know, like, where they, they'll, like, pick the vegetables, they get washed, and they just, like, chop them up really quickly. And they're flash, they're flash frozen there, which means the nutrients are locked in. Now, when they, when they transport, like, a bell pepper from Arizona to Colorado in the winter, you know, it's, it's not frozen, so the cells are still alive, and they're slowly losing their nutritional value in transport. So, like, in a lot of ways, like, frozen vegetables are better than, like, fresh vegetables. But obviously, if you have your own garden, like, you just picked it. Like, that's going to be the freshest you're going to get. But if it's transported from Arizona two weeks ago, it's going to have pretty low nutritional value. So, you're not going to lose a lot of potassium, though. They'd be more like vitamins. Like, minerals like potassium won't just disappear from a, a vegetable. They're going to stay there. Uh, organic molecules like vitamins, those would those would get lost. So, anyways, okay. So remember, aldosterone plays a role with potassium balance, 
And so we said that it stimulates potassium secretion, um, and uh, it does this by acting on uh, basically the, uh, the nephrons. And if you guys remember, uh, there's, there's cells that are sensitive to potassium in the adrenal cortex. So if the potassium levels in your, in your body are high, then the cells of your adrenal cortex release aldosterone, and the aldosterone favors potassium secretion and sodium reabsorption. So abnormal aldosterone levels can really severely influence potassium, you guys. So let's say if someone has like a secreting tumor of the adrenal cortex, uh, and they're getting like excessive release of aldosterone, that's going to really dramatically alter the potassium content of their body. Right? Uh, it's also going to affect your sodium too. But with respect to your neuromuscular system here, we said potassium is more important. And so they're going to see pretty dramatic changes in how excitable their muscles and nerves are. So uh, calcium is another important ion in their body. And what we find, you guys, is that this is um, important for like bone structure. In fact, 99% of your calcium is in your bones. Uh, and we know that there's actually hormones that can help us store calcium and release calcium when it's needed. But calcium is also important for things like blood clotting. It's involved with secretion of your, in your cells. It's involved with neuromuscular excitability because it's, you know, it plays a role with like the sarcoplasmic reticulum as well as the resting voltage of your neurons um, and cell membrane permeability, like co-transport of molecules across the plasma membrane. So uh, hypocalcemia would be low blood, uh, blah, low blood calcium. And if you have hypocalcemia, that actually makes your nervous system and your muscular system more excitable. And so, uh, uh, like if you have a muscle cramp, then that could be due to low calcium in your blood, right? Because that actually increases the resting membrane potential of your cells, so it makes them more positive. So it's easier to get a contraction in that regard. And if you have high extracellular calcium, that actually uh, decreases neuromuscular excitability because it, it makes your resting voltage more negative here. Um, now the hormone that controls potassium, I'm sorry, calcium is uh, parathyroid hormone. So if you guys remember, PTH or parathyroid hormone was released by the parathyroid glands behind your thyroid gland. And uh, this one's released when your calcium levels are low in your blood. So if your blood calcium levels are low, your parathyroid glands release parathyroid hormone. And, the, and PTH has three major effects. So PTH stimulates the osteoclasts of your bone to break down the bony matrix and release calcium in your blood. PTH also stimulates your kidneys to retain more calcium or reabsorb it. And PTH also stimulates your kidneys to make more vitamin D. Vitamin D is involved with calcium absorption in the gut. So let's check this out. So what this slide shows you guys is if you have low blood calcium, you get the release of parathyroid hormone from your parathyroid glands. It's got those three major effects. So for one, it stimulates the uh, breakdown of the bony matrix by stimulating the osteoclasts. Um, two, it allows you to retain more calcium in your kidney tubules and then uh, reabsorb it. And then three is it helps your kidneys activate vitamin D. That way you can actually reabsorb calcium in your gut. And all of these things increase blood calcium. So then you'd stop releasing parathyroid hormone once your calcium levels were normal, back within a normal range, and you reversed this hypocalcemia. Once, you've, once you're at like a normal range of calcium, your parathyroid hormone levels will go down. Now, what's kind of fascinating here, too, guys, is that uh, certain tumors can secrete parathyroid hormone-like molecules. And this is especially true in, like, lung tumors. Now, we'll go over this in more detail in pathophysiology, but uh, there are parathyroid hormone-secreting lung tumors. So you can have lung cancers that excessively secrete parathyroid hormone. So what do you guys think that's going to do to your blood calcium? It's going to increase it. What's it going to do to your bones? Good. It's going to decrease your bone mass and strength. So you're going to get brittling of the bones. So here's the weird thing, guys, is that we're saying that lung cancers, certain types, not all of them, but certain lung cancers can increase your blood calcium and make your bones more brittle. What's also going to do, what's also going to, do to your vitamin D levels in your blood? Increase it. So your vitamin D is going to be really high. Now, vitamin D is made from cholesterol. So it's also going to make your cholesterol levels very low. But remember... Steroid hormones are made from cholesterol. So now what you can have as a problem is if you make too much vitamin D and you're using up all your cholesterol, you're not going to have cholesterol left over to make things like certain steroid hormones like glucocorticoids. So now you're going to get other endocrine problems with this as well. So um, we'll, we'll kind of connect these dots in, in pathophysiology, but you're going to keep this stuff in mind.
So with acid base balance, you guys, um, we want to keep our blood within a fairly narrow range of blood pH. So we know that blood pH should be between 7.35 and 7.45. That's a pretty small range if you think about it, right? That's not a huge fluctuation of pH. So uh, the reason why we want to keep pH within normal range is that pH determines the functionality of all of your body's proteins. So that if your pH is sort of abnorm abnormal, then your body's proteins won't work normally, right? So that's why we're worried about like alkalosis or acidosis. If, you're, if your blood becomes too alkaline, enzymes stop working. If your blood becomes too acidic, enzymes stop working. So you want to keep within that narrow range there, right? So the normal pH of your body fluids would be things like 7.4 in most of your arteries. But you guys see that, that the pH is slightly lower in your veins. How would that make sense? Like, why would venous blood be slightly more acidic than arterial blood? What's in venous blood that's going to make it more acidic? Nice. Very good. Carbon dioxide, right? So that makes sense. So not always, but from most of the veins of your body, they're going to have higher carbon dioxide levels, which is going to make them more acidic here. Awesome. So in the intracellular fluid, uh, your, your pH of ICF is actually pretty neutral, right, at 7.0. However, that's much more acidic, you might say, than your blood pH, right? So that's just the way it is. So alkalosis refers to a, a blood pH above 7.45. And acidosis is below 7.35. So uh, the way we can maintain normal pH, you guys, is by three lines of defense. So the first line of defense are chemical buffers. So a chemical buffer um, is something that kind of helps maintain normal pH under changing concentrations of acid or base. The second line of defense is your respiratory system because you can breathe out carbon, excess carbon dioxide or not breathe out carbon dioxide. And then the third line of defense is your kidneys. Now, usually what you're trying to battle against, you guys, is acid. Because uh, as a consequence of metabolism, you're accumulating a lot of acid in your body fluids. So what we find, you guys, is that most of the hydrogen ions that are in your body come from metabolism. So they're metabolic acids, not respiratory acids. And you find things like phosphoric acid, lactic acid, fatty acids, as well as hydrogen ions that are liberated from, from carbonic acid. So lactic acid comes from anaerobic respiration. We talked about that already. We said that this was actually lactate, uh, was a consequence of uh, glycolysis under, under low oxygen conditions. Fatty acids can uh, come from keto, keto acids, which come from metabolism of fats, right? And you'd find that in conditions like diabetes, where they're having to rely more on the fats that are inside their cells rather than the sugar that's in the, in the blood. Um, and then uh, phosphoric acid comes from protein metabolism, right? So protein breakdown. And so what do you do with all this acid? Well, remember we've got three lines of defense. Remember our first line of defense, you guys, are the chemical buffers. So our chemical buffers, they don't eliminate the acids or bases. They just kind of like attenuate their effect on your pH, okay? So what a buffer would do would be like absorb excess acid or release acid. So I'll give you an example. If your blood were too acidic, the buffers that are in your blood can absorb that excess acid, and it keeps your blood from getting more acidic, okay? Because they're absorbing that acid, and they're preventing it from further acidifying your blood, okay? Or if your blood's too basic, these buffers can release acid into, their, into your blood and kind of keep them more in, a, in an acidic or normal range, right? So um, your lungs can also eliminate CO2. Your kidneys eliminate non-volatile and fixed acids. We call these metabolic acids. That's your three lines of defense again. So the fastest one is your buffers. But that doesn't help you get rid of anything. It just kind of helps you kind of keep things within a normal range, right? Um, your lungs eliminate carbon dioxide, which is a respiratory acid. You can't breathe out lactic acid or phosphoric acid um, because these things aren't gaseous molecules, right? So your lungs can only breathe out what are called volatile acids. An example of a volatile acid is carbonic acid because that can turn into a gas, which can volatilize into gas, which you can breathe out, right? Now, uh, your kidneys, though, can get rid of uh, excess metabolic acids like lactic acid or keto acids like your kidneys can take care of. Um, which one do you guys think would be faster? Do you think your lungs would be faster or your kidneys would be faster at getting rid of acids? Your lungs, for sure, right? So your lung, that's why it's the second line of defense, because your lungs are faster than your kidneys. Like, you can obviously breathe faster than you can make urine, right? So what we're saying here, guys, is that your respiratory system can also help maintain blood pH. 
And we've talked about this a little bit already back in the respiratory chapter, because we said that if your blood was too acidic, then you'll just breathe more heavily, because you can kind of blow off that carbonic acid, right? If your blood was too basic, you start breathing more slowly. That way you retain that acid, and it makes your blood more acidic again, and kind of reverses that, that basic trend, right? And so uh, your kidneys also play a role here too. So the way your kidneys regulate acid-base balance, you guys, is they can secrete or reabsorb acid. So if your blood's too acidic, they can secrete acid in your urine. If your blood's too basic, they can reabsorb acid back into your bloodstream. 